studying this quite in depth for some time. And when Jeffrey Smith brought his book out and I sat down and read that book, I said, whoa, this is the book we've been waiting for. This is the book that everybody in America needs to read. So I'm so pleased that you're here. Uh, I'll let Jeffrey fill you in a little bit his background and how he came into this issue. And so I bring you Jeffrey Smith. Hello, everyone. This is an amazing crowd. It's fantastic to see you all here. How many people are concerned about eating genetically modified foods? All right, so I'm preaching to the choir tonight. I say I'm arming the choir. How many people try to actively avoid eating genetically modified foods? Wow. Now keep your hands up for just a second. Now, keep your hands up if you know which foods are genetically modified. I find that amazing. So many people consciously try and avoid it, but they don't know which foods are. And that, by the way, Craig Winters is, a, is your champion. He is the man in charge of the labeling campaign, that we, the, uh, the big labeling campaign on Earth in the United States. Let's give Craig a big hand. He's a hero. He is definitely a hero. And how many people were born and raised in Florida? I just wanted to find out. <laughs> that many, huh? Both of you. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about the dangers of genetically modified foods and the cover-up of those dangers. And people have all sorts of reactions to this information. Now, you can choose which emotion you want to respond to, but I would like to encourage you to take that emotion and convert it into energy units. Maybe that energy unit or the action unit takes the, play, takes the form of filling out your letter to the congressperson and passing on the rest to the other five. Maybe that action unit takes the form of being more vigilant in actually avoiding genetically modified foods and studying the issue more closely. I invite you to sign up also for my electronic newsletter. By the way, Craig's is fantastic. It's, it's every week. It's, I read it every week. And mine is a little more semi whateverly Whenever I get back from some trip, I'll, I'll put together a journal of what happened. But uh, I invite you to sign up for that also. But whatever you do tonight, you can choose to make this night a turning point in your digestive life. You can choose for tonight to be a turning point in your choices. And so you can take that energy, whether it be fear or anger or sadness, and you can flip it. And you can flip it to the energy of empowerment, the energy of I'm in charge of what I am eating, and I choose not to be a victim. I choose not to be told by the biotechnology companies or their Washington branch, the FDA, what I am supposed to eat. I can choose for myself. All right, let's begin and talk about a little history of my, I'll tell you about a different history than Craig described. And this is the history of the genetically modified food and safety issues. I'll start in 1989. Individuals started going to doctors with all sorts of very severe symptoms. They had incredible pain, greater pain than the doctors had ever seen in their entire careers. Hair was falling out, there was memory loss, there was muscle weakness. Some people had their muscles tighten up and uncontrollably lock. The skin became leathery and painful. And the doctors were baffled. They had never seen this set of symptoms. Or maybe they thought it was something else like fibromyalgia because there was muscle pain involved. And, but they weren't sure. The doctors that did blood tests noticed an unusual signature of this disease. A white blood cell called the eosinophils, the count was huge. Some doctors had the uh, initiative to look in the literature and said, who knew a lot about eosinophils? And a name kept coming up over and over again, Jerry Gleick. And Jerry Gleick was from the Mayo Clinic, and he was one of the national experts on eosinophils. So this one doctor who I interviewed from New, New Mexico, he called Phil Gleick, and Phil said, you know, you're not the first doctor that called me about this set of symptoms with elevated white blood cells. Call this other doctor in New Mexico and see if their patients have something that's uh, similar in their histories. 
And sure enough, they had three different patients to deal with, and all three were taking the food supplement L-tryptophan. L-tryptophan, it's an essential amino acid. It's in turkey, it's in milk. In its pure form, it's necessary to take for our nutrition. But somehow, this was a, a common thread in their history. But they weren't, but Jerry Gleick and others were not too convinced yet that L-tryptophan, which had been sold over the counter safely for years, was the culprit. Until within two weeks, three more patients came to the Mayo Clinic and Jerry saw for himself. One was rolled in, they had to breathe through with a respirator, and all three were taking L-tryptophan. He called the Center for Disease Control and said, it's out there and it's deadly. What they found once they put the news in the newspaper, once it was in the New York Times, all of a sudden these doctors started getting calls from all over the country. Hundreds, thousands of people in the United States had these symptoms, were taking L-tryptophan, but were not diagnosed. The doctors and the patients did not know there was a deadly epidemic throughout the United States. Five to 10,000 people ultimately got this sickness. Some were permanently disabled, about 100 died. And it was all from taking this food supplement, L-tryptophan. So what was it about the L-tryptophan? Well, some wanted to argue that it was L-tryptophan itself. But consider this, all the people that got sick were only consuming one of the six brands in the United States. They were all produced in Japan, but only the Shoadenko brand was causing sickness. And it had some contaminants in it that the others didn't. So this concept that it was tryptophan itself, we'll throw that out. Then they found out that this company was genetically engineering the bacteria to produce the tryptophan more economically. And they had introduced a strain on December 24th, 1988. But two weeks later, they changed the filter method on their manufacturing process, reduced the amount of carbon, which could have allowed more contaminants to get through. This was the key for the biotechnology industry to jump on its excuse and say, aha, it wasn't genetic engineering, it was the change in the filter. And that's what got them off the hook. This sleight of hand saying, no, it wasn't. They didn't talk about how those contaminants could be in there. Originally, they just said there was a change in the filtration process. In my book, I bring out some research that was compiled from an eight-year investigation from a friend of mine it couldn't have been, this was, this was actually from the FDA representative to my friend Bill. The FDA representative said, it has to be something other than the genetic engineering of the strain because we know of at least of a dozen cases that occurred before the epidemic, which surfaced in May of 89. So this raises the question. And, they, and the person from the FDA said, so it, ha it was a before the genetic engineering of the strain, which was introduced in December of 88. My friend found out from a confidential document from lawyers involved with the lawsuit, which was eventually settled for $2 billion, that this bacterial strain that was introduced on December 24th, 1988, was called strain 5, strain 4, strain 3, and strain 2, since 1984, were genetically engineered. Moreover, it wasn't just a dozen individuals that got the disease before the outburst of the epidemic, it was hundreds. Hundreds got this disease between 1984 and the, outset, the outbreak of this epidemic. So what does that do to the change in filter story? You can throw that out. Because for four years, people were getting sick before the filter was changed. But only because, only from the genetically modified bacteria produced by Shoadenko. So it was almost certainly the genetic engineering of the strain which caused the problem. Now, my friend who discovered the fact that earlier strains were genetically modified was shocked that the FDA didn't know this information. They're the ones that told him in 1994 it must be something else besides the genetic engineering because it occurred, these incidences occurred before the engineering of the strain. But he was looking at that same document this confidential document that a lawyer entrusted with him that described all of the, st all of the stage of modification, 
and his eyes rose to the top of the page, and there was a fax imprint. Food and Drug Administration, 1990. They knew. They knew and kept silent about the fact that the earlier cases of this disease were from genetically modified bacteria from the same company. In fact, if you read the actual testimony before Congress by the FDA's representative describing, supposedly, the cause and ramifications of this epidemic, they never told Congress it was genetically modified. They never mentioned the word. They instead blamed the, the epidemic on health fraud schemes and got all L-tryptophan removed from the market. It's now only available by prescription. Now, it took a series of coincidences and good luck to, to, to track the fact that this epidemic came from L-tryptophan. Remember, there was that signature. The eosinophil count was very high. A rare set of very serious symptoms. Symptoms which came on soon after these individuals were taking the pill L-tryptophan. So, there were three characteristics, acute, rare, and fast onset. Imagine if only one of these were not there. Let's say it took 10 years to develop the sickness. The L-tryptophan would still be on the market, right? Let's say it was mild symptoms, like frequent colds, or memory loss, or memory loss. <laughs> <laughs> It would still be on the market. Let's say it were common ailments like cancer or heart disease or lymphoma or diabetes or obesity. You think they would rush people together and say, find out the history? Find out what you're doing and someone else is doing? And since there's so many things that can contribute to these other problems, you think they'd be able to sort it out? It's doubtful. So what about the other thousands of products on the market that are created from genetically modified crops? or bacteria or fungus. Might they be creating a problem that we don't know about and are not looking for? We know that food-related illnesses in the United States doubled between 1994 and 2001, at a time when a lot of new genetically engineered products were being introduced. I read last week that someone was very concerned in Russia about genetically modified foods because in the last three years, allergies skyrocketed, as they have in the United States. An interesting, an interesting coincidence, when genetically modified soybeans were first introduced into the United Kingdom, soy allergies in that country skyrocketed by 50%. Now, we know that the genetically modified soy, according to Monsanto's own research, has an increase in an allergen called trypsin inhibitor. So it has an increased allergen. But no one has done the tests to see if there are more allergic reactions to those taking genetically modified soy versus those taking conventional soy. So what's different between the genetically modified soy and the conventional soy? Why would it have increased trypsin inhibitor? It's only supposed to have one added trait. The added trait to 80 percent of the soybeans grown in the United States is called herbicide resistance. You see, Monsanto found a bacteria growing in a dump site behind their factory that was resisting death by their herbicide called Roundup. And they said, this is a great thing, let's put it in the food supply. So they found out what protein in the bacteria was causing this bacteria to survive. They found out which gene in the bacteria was creating that protein. They snipped it out. And typically, they, the way that you create a genetically modified product is you change the DNA, you change the genetic code, you add a few other things to it, you put it on a bunch of little microscopic BBs of gold, you put it in a gun, a gene gun, and you blast a 22, 22 caliber blast into a plate of cells and hope that some of your genes get in some of those DNA, cells' DNA. This is their precise method of insertion. And you don't know exactly where in the DNA it ends up. And the concept, the building foundation of genetically modified foods is that all you're doing is adding one trait, one gene to create one protein to create one trait, and everything else is fine. In reality, when you do that blasting, 
you can create all sorts of problems. There was a gene chip that monitored gene expression in the DNA at a time when the insertion occurred. Compared to prior to insertion, 5% of the host's genes were disrupted, meaning that they either increased, decreased, shut off entirely, or shut on entirely their production of protein. So if something is pumping out proteins at random that wasn't supposed to, what could that mean? This list will come up several times tonight. It could be allergenic, toxic, carcinogenic, anti-nutritional. If you shut down a gene, what could that mean? Some studies have found animal, laboratory animals have died, etc. We don't really know all the potential ramifications, but we do know that the most common result of genetic modification is surprises. Surprise side effects. When you genetically modify a bacteria to create L-tryptophan more economically, it means you produce more L-tryptophan in this fermentation broth. You also, they also, added genes to produce different enzymes. So all of a sudden you have a bunch of different enzymes and L-tryptophan together working out and doing some very complex interactions. One of the world's experts at biosynthesis of L-tryptophan said you can end up with, with creating new compounds that you weren't expecting. These new compounds can then interact with existing compounds to create yet new compounds. This could explain those six contaminants. Moreover, the actual L-tryptophan itself is toxic to the bacteria. So in high quantities, the bacteria may do something to modify the tryptophan or the environment to protect itself. So we have an incredible amount of opportunity for unpredicted side effects. And this is the process of genetic modification, and this is used to create enzymes and additives and cooking agents and aspartame, NutraSweet, the genetic modification of bacteria or fungus. That's the first category of genetically modified products. Now, the second category is milk products. Milk products from cows that have been injected with genetically engineered bovine growth hormone. It's interesting that in the process of approving genetically modified bovine growth hormone, a number of scientists spoke out at the FDA. And one, one talked about how the process was putting the public at risk, and he had a supervisory role in the evaluation of RBGH until he made that comment in public, and then he was stripped of responsibilities and sent to work at a trailer at an experimental farm on a different project. A division director who said that the industry had too much control over what the FDA was doing, he was forced out. A veterinarian who was asking for too many tests that was slowing the approval process down, he was fired. The remaining whistleblowers decided to be anonymous. They wrote an anonymous letter to Congress and said that there was conflict of interest and fraud going on at the agency. They talked about Margaret Miller, who for Monsanto, created a bunch of experiments in RBGH, then moved to the FDA to evaluate her own research. She also, according to this letter, at random, changed the amount of allowable antibiotics in milk. In order to approve this injection, it was going to increase infections, it was going to increase the use of antibiotics, so she raised the level from one part per 100 million to one part per million, a 100-fold increase. When the Congress people eventually did an investigation, they also looked into Michael Taylor. Michael Taylor, just before becoming the number two man in the FDA in charge of policy, the man who decided that, cows, that milk from cows injected with RBGH does not have to be labeled, he was formerly attorney for Monsanto Corporation. Monsanto produces RBGH. He later became a high-ranking official in the USDA and later the vice president for Monsanto. And that's not unique. If we look into the current and previous administrations, there's a revolving door. In fact, one interesting comment, someone described the Monsanto Board of Directors as a virtual retirement home for former Clinton administrators. And in addition to seeing the kind of pressure that was put on the US scientists, 10 years later when Canada was evaluating RBGH, the same thing happened there. Six scientists testified before 
parliament there that they had been pressured and one was told that if he didn't approve RBG, he shipped off where no one would hear from him again. They said that Monsanto offered them a bribe of one to two million dollars if they approved the RBGH without further research. Monsanto responded on national Canadian TV that they had misunderstood an offer for research money. <laughs> Documents were stolen out of a locked file cabinet. And they eventually got permission to approve, actually to review the FDA's evaluation of RBGH and wrote a volume this thick on how it was full of gaps and improper assumptions and omissions, which I analyzed in my chapter three called Spilled Milk. And I described some of the research that the FDA used to defend approval. For example, I think you'll find this one entertaining, this bit of quote science. The FDA scientists wrote an article in Science Magazine and said that the amount of, of natural bovine growth hormone in milk does not increase substantially in cows treated with RBGH, but even if it did increase, it wouldn't matter because 90% is destroyed during pasteurization. I looked into this with the help of some other investigators, and it turns out there actually was, according to the citations that they were using, a 26% increase in this growth hormone. A 26% increase in a hormone. But apparently that wasn't significant because the researchers only injected three cows. And I read in the study, they injected the cows with 10.6 milligrams per day, parentheses, the daily, the approximate dose. Now, by the time I read this, I'd been doing a lot of investigation, and when it said approximate dose, my red flags went up, and I called a friend of mine who I knew would give me the straight scoop because he had published in his dairy newsletter the, some stolen documents from the FDA years earlier. And he had showed, he had showed that um, when Monsanto wanted to verify that injections did not interfere with fertility, the researchers apparently added cows to the study that were pregnant before injection. When cows got sick, they were removed from studies altogether. It also showed that immediately following injection, there was an increase in hormone levels in the blood of up to a thousand fold. So I said to my friend Pete Harden, Pete, it says 10.6 milligrams per day, the average dose, the approximate dose. He immediately said, no one injects every day. It would be economically infeasible. Dairy farmers inject every two weeks. I said, how much do they inject? He said 500 milligrams, not 10.6. The researchers actually used a different company's RBGH, one that was never approved, slightly different formulation, but used a daily dose instead of that big two biweekly dose. And we know from the stolen documents that on the biweekly dose, hormone levels skyrocket by as much as a thousand fold. So perhaps they chose a daily dose to avoid that spike in hormone levels in the milk. But it doesn't matter, right, because 90% is destroyed during pasteurization? Well, the same undergraduate did that research also. And they heated milk for 30 minutes at 162 degrees. Normally at that temperature, you heat milk for 15 seconds and call it pasteurized. So they heated milk 120 times longer. Imagine heating a turkey 120 times longer than the instructions. But they only destroyed 19%. They only destroyed 19%. They added powdered hormone. 146 times the natural occurring level of hormone, heated it 120 times longer, and were then able to destroy 90%. And that's what the FDA quoted. That was what the FDA used as a basis for safety. Now, we don't know if this particular hormone is bad for human beings. We may not even have receptors for it. But that's not the only thing that increases in milk. Antibiotics increase in milk, pus increases in milk. That's treated from RBGH, but also IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor one. Two very sophisticated journals published this information in 1998. Premenopausal women with high levels of IGF-1 are seven times more likely to develop breast cancer. Outside of family history, it's the number one risk factor. Men are four times more likely to develop prostate cancer. IGF-1 is also implicated in colon and lung cancer. IGF-1 in milk is identical chemically to the IGF-1 in human beings, and milk drinkers tend to have higher levels of IGF-1. And 
the milk from cows treated with RBGH has higher levels of IGF-1. <coughs> Sobering news, isn't it? So that's the second category. Milk, dairy products from cows treated with genetically modified bovine growth hormone. So let's talk about the first category, the one that most people know about, the crops. And let's talk about the FDA once again. Because in, the F in 1992, the FDA formulated a policy on genetically modified crops. They said no testing was necessary if the industry that created the foods believed it were safe, then they could bring it on the market without even telling the FDA. <coughs> no long-term safety testing required, no notification required, and they justified this policy with the following sentence. We know of no information showing that the foods created from these new methods differ in any meaningful or uniform way. We know of no information. Remember that. I'm going to test you on it. We know of no information. And that's what Americans believed. They figured that the, the FDA scientists got together, looked around, couldn't find any information. Oh, must be the same. Years later, a friend of mine spearheaded a lawsuit against the FDA. He got 44,000 documents, internal, formerly secret documents, and it showed what was really going on. The scientists said, these foods can create, remember that list, allergies, toxins, carcinogens or new diseases, antibiotic resistant diseases, that's a new one, nutritional problems. They also said these problems would not necessarily be obvious to those who create the foods, and therefore they must be subjected to long-term safety testing before being f fed to the public. One person summarizing all the comments from the scientists of the agency said, the technical experts at the agency believe that these foods are different than foods created from normal con conventional means, and they have different risks. You remember what the comment was in the policy? We know of no difference. You know who was in charge of that policy? Michael Taylor, former attorney to Monsanto. He was in charge overseeing the rewriting of this policy. One comment from a scientist at the FDA made public from the lawsuit was, what's happened to this document? It's become a very pro political document, very pro-industry. It doesn't address consumer concerns. And he said, this is the industry's pet idea, namely that there's no unintended side effects, but the data doesn't support this. So they were aware that there could be unintended side effects. When the experts in, Canadian, in the Canadian Royal Society looked at it, they said the, defa the default prediction of genetic modification is unintended side effects, and that there's no justification to assume that they're safe. David Suzuki says, if a politician or a scientist tells you that GM foods are safe, he's either very stupid or lying. David Suzuki is a geneticist. You may have seen him on PBS. So this was the concern by the scientists, but the number two person at the FDA, Michael Taylor, and even the number one person, the commissioner. The commissioner wrote a letter, which became public from the lawsuit, which said, the biotechnology policy is now in tune with the intentions of the general biotechnology policy of the White House, which is to also ensure the safe and speedy development of the US biotechnology industry. <coughs> There was a huge movement to popularize genetic engineering because America was the breadbasket of the world and America was the provider of technology for the world. Let's put them together. This was also industry's goal. When Arthur Anderson, a consultant for Monsanto, described how they had consulted with Monsanto, they said, describe your ideal future in 15 to 20 years. And the, the um, Monsanto executive said, we see a world in which 100% of all commercial seeds are genetically modified and patented. And then the Arthur Anderson consultant announced that they worked backwards from that goal to create the strategy and tactics to achieve it. And key to their success was the influence that Monsanto had in the government, which was legendary. One commenter who was in charge of biotechnology issues for about 20 years said, that the regulatory agencies in the government have done everything that big agribusiness has asked them to do and told them to do. <laughs>
So that's the situation we face. They recommended long-term safety testing, thing that big agribusiness has asked them to do and told them to do. So that's the situation we face. They recommended long-term safety testing, the scientists, but the policymakers did not. In fact, when that document was sent up to higher levels of political influence, someone from the Office of Management and Budget said, we should put a sentence in here which says, the foods created from these new methods are safer because it's a more precise method of creating foods. So as the, as the evaluation went up the political ladder, the foods got safer and safer. So what happens when you do submit these foods to long-term safety testing? I would like to know too. Do you know how many animal feeding studies have been done on genetically modified foods and published? Anyone? There's actually 10. Two were done independently, eight were done by industry, but several of those eight were commercial feeding studies. They weren't really safety studies. Now I'll tell you about industry-sponsored versus independently-sponsored studies. Aspartame, NutraSweet, it's created through genetic modification. It was responsible for 80% of complaints one year to the FDA about potential health side effects. Between 1985 and 1995, approximately 166 studies were done in aspartame, divided almost evenly between independently sponsored and company sponsored. 100% of the independently sponsored studies raised questions about aspartame. Some indicated the possibility of brain tumors. What percentage, by coincidence, of the company sponsored studies raised a question? Zero. So two of the 10 studies were independently done. Eight were done by industry. Let's talk about those two. Let's talk about one of those two. They were done by the same person, Dr. Arpad Pustai. Dr. Arpad Pustai, leading researcher in his field. It's a brand of protein called lectin. He had started, he was working at the leading nutritional laboratory in Europe. He was invited there 35 years or 37 years ago by a Nobel laureate to work in his laboratory and he had become the leader in his field. He had over 300 scientific studies done, about 12 books edited or written, and he was a money magnet for grant money because he was so thorough and uh, well thought of. And he won a grant over 27 competitors, which was the big biotech grant from the British government. They were to create the protocol for long-term safety testing, the long-awaited protocol. This was actually in the mid-90s, nothing had been published at that point, so it was all new territory. But he was called in because he had done nutritional safety testing for years. And he was leading a 20-member team in three different institutions. And as part of their creating of the protocol, which was to be adopted by both the United Kingdom and also eventually by Europe, they created a genetically modified potato. The potato was genetically modified to produce an insecticide. Now let's back up here for just a second and talk about that aspect of crops that are registered as pesticides, because you eat them. There are certain corn that we eat that's genetically, modif genetically modified to produce an insecticide called Bt. Cotton also is genetically modified to produce Bt. We eat cottonseed oil. It's interesting that farmers have told me that when they give cows a choice, Cows reject genetically modified corn. Normally, cows will eat the corn to the end of the trough. Whatever's there, they'll continue eating till it's gone. The first farmer put in a trough, genetically modified on one side, conventional on the other. He let his 25 cows in, and they all congregated on one side of the trough and never ate the ones on the other side. When this was told to other farmers, they repeated this study over and over again with cows and hogs. Leaving, letting two or three into a pen at once, and they had two different troughs. The first one genetically modified corn, the second one conventional corn, and the same thing happened over and over and over again. They'd go up to the first trough, they'd smell it, maybe they'd taste it, they'd go to the next trough, they'd finish it off. They'd go back to this one, they'd smell it, and then they'd walk away. Geese avoided eating genetically modified Roundup Ready soybeans from a field, they only ate the conventional on the side of the field. Mice, no, rats were, were fed a tomato, and they didn't eat it. I think this is a great selling point. Are rats eating your tomatoes? 
Well, you can have this tomato, which survives longer on your, self, on your shelf, and rats reject it. <laughs> well, they force-fed the rats. This was a study that was actually reviewed by the FDA. And they developed stomach lesions. Seven of 40 died within two weeks. They were replaced in the study. The tomatoes were approved. Anyway, that was an, let's get back to Arpad Pustai's potatoes. He was genetically engineering a potato to produce an insecticide. The insecticide was a, was a lectin. That was what he was an expert in. And this lectin he knew most about. He had studied it for six and a half years and was sure that it was harmless to humans and rats. So he was surprised to discover that the rats that were fed the genetically modified potato developed problems. But the rats that were fed the potato spiked with this lectin insecticide did not develop the problems, nor did the rats who were just eating the potatoes. It was only those that were genetically modified to produce the lectin. So this is significant information. He had taken a gene from the snowdrop plant and put it into the potato to produce this protein, which was an insecticide. He knew the protein was safe. So why did his rats develop potentially precancerous cell growth in the intestines and stomach smaller brains, livers, and testicles, partial atrophy of the liver, damaged immune system. We're not exactly sure why, but we know it's probably the process of genetic modification and not that specific lectin, right? It's not the specific lectin. I spend a lot of time in the first chapter of my book describing the events around Dr. Arpad Pustai, and I'll leave the good stuff for the read. But I'll tell you, in short, he went public with his information, was fired from his job after 35 years, silenced with threats of a lawsuit, eventually invited to speak before Parliament, got his data back, and the gag order was lifted, and his study was published in The Lancet, and remains the most in-depth animal feeding study ever done on genetically modified foods. I interviewed Dr. Arpad Pustai extensively, and I asked the question, what was the most shocking moment? What was the highest drama? Why was, why was I asking that question? Because I was writing a book. <laughs> You'll see in the book that I write for drama and weave the science into it. No one's going to buy a textbook, and I wanted to appeal to a large number of people, so I had to write, as Laurie said earlier, the X-Files stories. I had to write about the bribery and the scientist who claims that a, that a Mexican government official threatened him, even implying we know where your children go to school, and how fictitious names created by PR companies created an entire internet sensation to attack in, in research that was incriminating against genetic engineering, and how threatening letters from Monsanto have shut down stories from TV and newspapers and books. So I write that for your entertainment. So I asked him what was the most shocking moment. And it wasn't being fired after 35 years. It wasn't the moment that he discovered the damage to the rats. I was banking on one of those two, but I would have lost the bet. Evidently, I was the only one that asked him that question, because he had been interviewed hundreds of times but never told this story. He said months before this episode happened, his director, Professor James, walked into his office with a stack <coughs> of about 700 pages, put it on his desk. Arpad's wife, a senior scientist at the Rowett Institute, came in. The director said, this is the submissions from the biotechnology companies for their food, six or seven foods. The Minister of Agriculture wants a scientific opinion on these. He's meeting in Brussels with the other EU ministers. Now, Arpad Pustai looked at this man and then looked at the stack and looked back at the professor and realized this man would never actually read these pages, but he was on the committee to approve the foods. And he also, Arpad also realized that most of the members of the 12-member committee were too busy. They weren't working scientists. They were on a lot of different committees. They were committee men. But Arpad and his wife had been spending the last two years evaluating and designing the appropriate protocol for safety testing for every variety before it was to be introduced to the market. So they were among the most qualified people on earth to review the stack of pages. They said, how much time do we have? The professor said, two and a half hours. When reading those studies, he went straight for the data and the design, because he, he didn't have a lot of time. 
He said, reading those studies was the most shocking moment because he was appalled at how bad the science was, how bad research was, and how little industry was prepared to do in order to get its foods on the market as quickly as possible and expose them to human beings. He said, at that moment, he realized that what industry was doing and what he was doing, which was safety testing, was diametrically opposed. And it was a turning point in this very pro-biotech scientist's life. He called up the minister and said, I wasn't planning to give you a strong recommendation at this point after only two and a half hours, but I have to say, there is definitely not enough information here to allow these foods to be fed to human beings or to animals. The minister said, I don't know why you're telling me this. Your professor's committee approved these two years ago. They were already on the market. Now, here is the catch. One, the potatoes would have made it to the market. Our Bud Pustai's tomato potatoes that hurt those rats would have made it to the market had they been submitted to that superficial research. They never tested for the things he tested for. Here's the second one. The soy and the corn and the tomatoes that were approved were never tested for that, which means they could be creating the same thing in rats, if they're willing to eat it, and in human beings. So that's the sobering point about long-term safety testing. There's only been one real, and it was only preliminary. I mean, when he found out the results, he contacted the very pro-biotech British government and said, we need to have more money to investigate the cause. But they didn't give him any more money. In fact, when they fired him, they dismantled the team, stopped doing the work, and there is no independent long-term safety testing program. But we still have those same evaluation from the FDA scientists. Allergies, toxins, new diseases, antibiotic-resistant diseases. Here's an interesting one, antibiotic-resistant diseases. When you take a, a gene from one species and you blast it into a pile of cells, you have no idea which cell gets your gene into the DNA. You can't put it under a microscope. It's too small. So what they do is they put into the, they attach to this gene what's something called an antibiotic resistant marker gene, ARM, arm, an arm gene. And they blast that in, and then once the cells get this 22 caliber blast, they douse it with antibiotics. If the cell, the arm gene, gets into the DNA, it, it, re it renders it invincible to antibiotics. So those genes, that, those cells that survive, got the genes into their DNA. And that's why you put this antibiotic resistant marker gene, and that's the only time it's used. When the flavor saver tomato was first being approved by the FDA, it was the first crop back in the early 90s, they asked the division of anti-infective drugs what they thought about introducing an arm gene. The director wrote a comment, a memo entitled, The Tomato That Will Eat Akron. In all capital letters, he said it would be a serious health hazard. Why? Because that antibiotic-resistant marker gene just might jump off of the food that we eat onto the bacteria in our stomachs and intestines. Bacteria is very promiscuous. They could pass that gene on to pathogenic bacteria, and all of a sudden we have pathogenic bacteria accidentally genetically engineered to resist death by antibiotics. The response by the biotechnology industry to this threat, which, by the way, was one of the reasons why the British Medical Association called for a ban on genetically modified foods, the biotechnology industry said, not to worry, DNA is destroyed during digestion. This was one of a very long list of assumptions that have been proven wrong. And it's a very interesting study how they proved it wrong in human beings. They took seven volunteers. This was a British government study. This is the only human feeding study ever done, except the big one that we're all part of. Which, by the way, the same British government's agency wanted to monitor. They contacted the Safeway and other executives from the big retail chains in England and said, you have a loyalty card program, and so you have the records of 30 million consumers. We've got the medical records. 
We want to see if those eating genetically modified foods have higher levels of cancer, childhood allergies, and birth defects. Since they had previously announced that they were, um, that GMOs were safe, when this information was leaked to the public, the embarrassed government decided not to do the follow-up. So we actually don't have any monitoring of that sort. But they did do this study where they took seven human volunteers, and these volunteers had colostomy bags. They had their lower intestines removed, not for the study. <laughs> and they fed these volunteers soy burgers and a soy milkshake. The soy is genetically modified. Remember, it's herbicide resistant. It doesn't die when it, herbicide is applied. So the first thing they did is they looked in the colostomy bag and, fed, and found that they were totally surprised at how much intact DNA made it through past the small intestine. Then they took the bacteria out of the colostomy bag and they put it in different dishes and they added herbicide. And lo and behold, for three of the seven volunteers, their bacteria survived. It's also possible that another genetic construct that they put in with the gene before they do the blasting, that that also jumps. Now this construct is called a promoter. Let me explain why they use promoters. If you take a gene out of bacteria and you blast it into a soybean, that gene will just sit there. Even if it gets into the DNA, it will do nothing. Because, as you all know, there's a little man behind the DNA that controls all the genes and pushes some up and pushes some down, but has no idea what to do with this new gene. So, they take a piece of a virus, which is known to overpower this guy's control, and it turns on the gene 24-7 high volume, and it's attached to the gene, and it, get blast it gets blasted in together. The theory was, this is another one of those assumptions that have been proven wrong, the theory was that the promoter will only turn on the gene to which it's attached. But guess what? Sometimes it turns on genes down the DNA, even on a different chromosome. And it can pump out proteins 24-7 high volume in spite of this man's objection. So what could possibly be the results of pumping out a protein 24-7? We've been through this list. Allergens, toxins, carcinogens, new diseases, nutritional problems. It could be great. It could end up turning on the master gene. Or it could be worse. Now, there are some scientists that believe that if this promoter gene jumps onto our internal organs, it might create unregulated cell growth, which could lead to right, cancer. Now, this particular scientist that I quote, Dr. Stanley Ewan, he was the one that actually examined the inside of Arpad Pustai's rats and found extra cell growth. Those are a couple of the 21 re ways in which genetically modified foods can create unpredicted side effects, which is in my second chapter. So let's change modes here. We've kind of worked our way down into the depths of possible problems. I can also mention some other things, for example, the. The corn currently on the market would probably certainly not pass the World Health Organization's recommended tests for keeping allergens off the market that are genetically modified. There's a lot of implications that it should never have been approved. And we'll talk about, we won't talk about some of the other ways in which studies were rigged to avoid finding problems, some of the eight out of the ten. But let's talk about what we can do. Now, I personally believe that genetically modified foods are one of the most serious threats to health and the environment. I also think it's one of the easiest battles to win. We don't have to convince the Bush administration of anything. They pretty much have bought the biotech line, as did the administration before them. Dan Glickman, former Secretary of Agriculture, for the Clinton administration, a big, um, big pro-GMO guy, a big cheerleader, went around Europe trying to sell G American GMOs to Europe. He said before stepping down in an interview, what I saw generically on the pro-biotech side was that the technology was good and that it was almost immoral to say that it wasn't good because it was going to solve the problems of the human race and feed the hungry and clothe the naked. 
And if you're against it, you're Luddites, you're stupid. And that, frankly, was the side our government was on. And you felt like you're almost disloyal and alien by trying to present an open-minded view. So this is an indication of the thinking of the government, which means maybe they're not liars, maybe they're just bought into mythology, which is what I believe. So how do we combat that thinking, which was paid for by a $50 million yearly budget for advertising, $142 million spent in 2001 for lobbying Washington, and all sorts of revolving door of people that go from biotech to the administration. I don't want to fight that battle, but I don't have to. There's two other ways. One is through labeling, and Craig is the champion for labeling. 94% people said that they want the foods labeled. More than half said they wouldn't eat it if it were labeled, which raises the point about consumer purchasing power. Consider this. Unilever, Britain's largest food manufacturer, in April of 1999, declared and committed to remove genetically modified foods from all of its ingredients. Within one week, there was an avalanche. Every single major food manufacturer said the same thing. McDonald's, Burger King, Safeway, Nestle's, for their European brands. And you know who, who won that battle? The top of the food chain, consumers. And you know why the consumers in Europe are concerned? If you listen to the biotechnology industry, they'll tell you it was an illegal trade barrier, or cultural, or anti-Americanism, or something other than food safety concerns. I heard them say this at various biotech industry conferences. At the same time that I had been reading for five years the British press, and you know what they reported on? Arpod pustai, damaged rats, antibiotic resistance, British Medical Association wanting to have a ban. They're actually reporting on this stuff. At the same time, the United States media is completely closed-lipped about the potential safety hazards, and certainly about the corruption that's going on. That is why there's resistance there and not here. A study showed that the more people know about genetic modification, the more concern they have. Enter my book. The more information, the more concern. Consumers concern, steps to protect themselves. Steps to protect themselves, avoid eating genetically modified foods, avoiding eating genetically modified foods, pressure on the industry. They don't need to lose 10% market share in order to make a change in their ingredients. You can be sure of that. Just a little indication that they're dropping market share, seeing a trend, and that's it. They don't gain anything from using genetically modified foods like corn and soy, they can tell their farmers, if they're large enough, they can contract direct with the farmers, they already do. Frito-Lay has told its farmers not to grow genetically modified corn. Gerber's taken GMOs out of its baby food. Trader Joe's, Whole Foods, Wild Oats, they've taken out of their brand names or committed to do so. But the biggies like Kraft were on their case. My background, by the way, I worked at a GMO detection lab, but not as a laboratory technician, as the vice president of marketing. I did marketing and communications for, a, for the precursor to that, to Craig's um, group that was trying to get the products labeled, and I also worked with political groups. So that's why I wrote a book, because I knew I couldn't rely on the public relations angle, because I'd seen um, colleagues of mine not get any press on some very inflammatory information, like the guy that discovered all the conflicts of interest and in lying at the FDA with all the secret documents, he couldn't get anyone to cover it. But a book can be handed from person to person. And I had a lot of confidence because I knew what Silent Spring had done to DDT when it became popular. And it was popular among people and it was popular among decision makers. And also The Jungle, the book The Jungle was handed to Teddy Roosevelt just before he got on the train. By the end of the train ride, he was determined and did create meat inspection for the United States. So in addition to getting the book popular, I have a second proposal, or a second um, plan, and that is to hand the book to as many world leaders as possible, just before they get on trains. 
So I went to the World Trade Organization, I went to the FTAA recently, I went to Brussels, I went to Brazil, and I'm handing out books. And in fact, the organization that Craig um, initially founded, Citizens for Health, they receive um, tax-deductible donations on my behalf, they buy books, and I hand them out. So that's my strategy, that's my marketing strategy. I'm open book about it, in fact, I describe it in the last chapter, I say what I wrote, what I didn't, and why. Basically, the book is about food safety and corruption. I don't talk about environment, even though I think it's the worst danger, because you can't recall the genes or the fish from the ocean or the air. I don't talk about farmer issues. I save that for a second book I'm writing. This is a book on food safety because this, I think, is the leverage to change people's diet. There are some people in this room that might change their diet for environmental purposes. Most people in the country will not. But talk about protecting your children from the kinds of things we talked about. Man, that's leverage. So that's why I wrote the book. And I need some help. I can't do it alone. I count the number of people that I talk to, and I count the number of radio shows that I'm on, and I multiply it by how many people I need, and I need some help. So if you feel so inspired, you're welcome to get a book and pass it on once you've read it. So I invite you to participate if you so choose. But I'll tell you, it's working. All right, so how to avoid eating genetically modified foods. Chapter eight in my book is called that, how to avoid eating genetically modified foods. I also have information on my website, which is seedsofdeception.com, easy to remember. There are basically four major crops, soy, corn, cottonseed, and canola. Soy, corn, cottonseed, and canola. Everyone, soy, corn, cottonseed, and canola. You will remember these <laughs> if you want to remove GMOs from your diet. If you buy organic, it's not legally allowed to contain genetically modified ingredients. Many products in health food stores say non-GMO. Short of that, you have to avoid soy, corn, cottonseed, and canola, and the offspring of soy and corn, which is high fructose corn syrup, corn sweeteners, maltodextrin, dextrose, soy lecithin, soy protein isolate, things like that. And then there's a little bit of genetically modified zucchini and crookneck squash, and the majority of papayas from Hawaii. The tomato, off the market. The potato, off the market. There's a cigarette called Quest, one, two, three. Those are genetically modified. There's also the milk from treated cows, it has to say organic or no, no artificial hormones. And then there's these enzymes and additives which are much more difficult to identify. It's easier to avoid them by either making your food from raw ingredients or buying organic. Aspartame is one that is labeled. The rest are generally not. Hard cheeses have chymosin used instead of rennet. 80% of the hard cheeses in the United States use this genetically modified chymosin as an enzyme. So I have, some of this I have all this information in my book. How many people have read my book? Okay, how many people felt some emotion from reading the book? Okay, here's, now, here's my big risk. How many people made some changes in their diet or reinforced changes in their diet they'd already made for reading the book? Okay, almost everyone. So it's working. So that's, my, that's what I'm doing. 